Obviously, we both have this appreciation for Seneca's life and philosophy, but you started this this podcast, Soul Searching with Seneca, a while back. Tell me about how that started. Sure. Seneca was extremely influential in my life. He was the philosopher who actually I came to first when I was exploring you know, what is philosophy? I, d I didn't even really know what it was. To me back then, this was you know, maybe five or six years ago, philosophy was this kind of ivory tower sort of thing. That was the image that I had of it. It wasn't for the, for the everyday people. But then when I started reading Seneca, I realized that philosophy could also be extremely practical advice for everyday life, for how you can you know, have, have a more meaningful, flourishing existence. It was very practical. And I think I mentioned this in, in a meetup that I, I ran a few weeks back where Ode to Seneca, that's what the, 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 the meetup was all about, is about Seneca. And I talked about how Seneca has changed with me. And it's always beautiful when you can find a philosopher, a teacher, you know, you could consider them to be a friend if you spend enough time with their works, who morphs and changes as as your, your internal world is changing as well when you're on a spiritual or philosophical path. And what I realized over time is that Seneca has the real earthy, practical, day-to-day -day advice, but he also just has a really profound grasp of the Stoic philosophy and the theology as well. And he is a true seeker of, of wisdom. And, and, and he's also somebody who wrestles with God, you know, like in his writings, he, he deals with deep theological, metaphysical questions. And so I, I have just adored Seneca's works over time because they are so linked to me and my own path, I feel. You know, I feel like he's always speaking directly to me through his writings. And I think a lot of people feel that because of, the, because of the style of how he writes. But when I started the Soul Searching with Seneca podcast, it was about saying, well, let me continue this dialogue with Seneca, but in public. And it really is, it's, it is genuinely, and has been up until this point, a dialogue between me and Seneca. Because I pick these little parts and I, I break it down and I try to figure it out on the spot right there, you know, as I'm recording. These are not highly planned episodes. It's me just reading a piece and saying, what, what is he trying to say here? You know, what, how can I, how can I learn from this? And now we're at the stage where there's 120 episodes that are my solo episodes. I think I'm covering, covering up to about letter 35. So 120 episodes for 35 letters. Now I'm doing this with Judith Stove. And having her on board, she's, you'll know this, but your listeners won't she, necessarily. She's this wonderful woman who I met over in Australia who has such a phenomenal grasp on the languages. She, she knows Greek. She knows classical Latin. And, and she's such a classicist by heart. And so having her side by side with me, we just recorded our first episode together yesterday on letter number 40. But she's pointing out these words that Seneca uses that I have no idea really what they mean, but she's, yeah, I took this to my, to my professor and he said that this is like the only case we know of this word in the world and here's what it means <laughs> and here's why Seneca uses it, here's why Seneca uses this dictation here. And it's great because now I'm getting, now I'm seeing what's underneath Seneca's writings that you just don't get in the English translation. So it's, it's super geeky, but it's also so much fun. Mm. What do you mean by changing? I think if I heard correctly, Seneca changing, you changing, could you say more? Yeah, I think it was John Viveki, who I think it was him who said the reason that Plato is sacred to him is because he reads Plato and then he goes out into the world and the world changes him and then he comes back to Plato and Plato has changed. You know, there's there's this constant back and forth. If you find a really profound teacher, I, I think, What's, what, what makes a text profound or deep, you know, the Bible is one of the classic examples of this, sacred literature, we call it sacred because it, 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 it morphs, it does change. And perhaps it, it doesn't change, but 
it invites you into an adventure and the adventure is do you really understand this and 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 over time you kind of think you have a grasp on some things but with seneca it just gets deeper and deeper and deeper people are, you know can often think well, it's, it's just moral letters you're just sitting there moralizing no there's profound theology in here and really profound advice but you catch certain parts over time based on where you are in your life and based on your philosophical understanding and what what you have a grasp on and what you don't so for me that's what it is it's it's just this constant i'm changing and then seneca you know as i said it's not necessarily that he has changed or his writing has changed but it opens up in mm. in new ways constantly that that's interesting you know I'm a fan of, of Heraclitus and the no one ever steps in the same river twice mm. type of idea. You know, is there some truth? Could we apply that to no one ever reads one of Seneca's letters twice or, or a book twice? I think that's a really interesting point. Yeah, that's. I think that's a really interesting way of looking at it because you can't help but bring a new experience or, you know... A, heck you have breakfast this morning or you don't that's going to change the way you read this book do you know what i mean it's like we are constantly <laughs> in that motion and yeah i think if if you come to the text with sincerity and a genuine desire to get as much out of it as you possibly can you will you'll get as much out of it as you possibly can you being you where you are who you are right now but even that i mean you go away and live for a couple of years then you come back to his letters or to any great book, it's going to, yeah, I think, I think it's going to reveal new, new understandings for you. You know, that's, what's mm. beautiful about reading. Hey, it's just, it's a yeah. dialogue with you and the author and that never stops. Yeah. For some reason, I always think of this, the idea of some sort of conversation. It feels much more like a conversation when you're reading some of Seneca's writing compared to others. But I want to ask, why do you think some don't take to, to Seneca? Or you could apply that to anybody, but since we're on the topic of Seneca, why do some not necessarily see the, see the wisdom? I don't know. I mean, like, everybody's got their flavor. You know what I mean? Like, everybody's, everybody's different, so we're drawn to different things. I think that one of the reasons I was drawn to Seneca is because... Well, perhaps it's something. It maybe maybe it's not the reason I was drawn to him. It's the thing that has solidified my love for his his works over time, is the fact that I am an artist myself and you know a writer. I probably consider myself an orator as well because you know I speak publicly. You know, Seneca was a real Renaissance man, despite the fact that he came before the Renaissance. But he was in in the sense of the term because he. He, he wrote plays, you know, and prolifically, you know, he, he wrote so much and all of these letters and, and he, he was such a creative individual. And so for me, I'm really drawn to, well, I put it like this yesterday, I said to, to Judith and we were talking about how, how important it is for us personally and for me personally, how important it is that Seneca's writings are beautiful. They are beautiful. He focuses on beauty in his writing. It has to be, it has to be beautiful. And so that's very important to me. But, you know, there are other people out there who have different tastes and styles and maybe they don't really care for the, the beauty or the fluff. You might th they might think of it as fluff, you know. Here he is just writing pretty, but is there any substance? There is substance, but some people prefer different things. Some people prefer Marcus Aurelius or Heraclitus. And I don't know. I was just drawn to Seneca, and that's that's why. He's sometimes labeled as a as a bit of a, a hypocrite, for, but for some reason, I I find it strange because in this in this letter that the listeners will have have just uh, listened to a bit of on the philosopher's seclusion, he writes, "I point other men to the right path." which I have found late in life. And, you know, you think of like Socrates, for example. Rarely is he, I don't, not sure I've ever heard him labeled as a, as a hypocrite or anything like that. But, 
when he made some of these virtuous decisions and, and things like that, he's in his 70s. He's later in life. I wonder, two decades prior, in, in his early 50s, like, you know, is there such a thing of someone who doesn't veer off the path? Like, sometimes I wonder in, in some of that, which, which came up, you know, in your great talk on the Ode to Seneca, it's like, I don't know, do we have unrealistic expectations of the virtuous path? It seems like he's being very honest and, and transparent of where he's he's veered off and, and trying to share those lessons. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. I think you're right. And I I have always had the the, the sense that, you know, we, <laughs> okay, if you're going to call Seneca a hypocrite, okay, you know, how much do you know about his life? How much do you know about the kinds of decisions that he had to make? Have you written 120 plus epistles? Have you written you know, 10 plays, have you, you know, like, I, and I, I don't mean to get, it's not like a, it's not like a, a creation competition, but, but I guess what I'm saying is, well, I, I think that my sense of Seneca, as I've gotten to know his writings, and he does talk about this sometimes, is that at the time that he's writing these epistles, he's kind of moving away from public life. Now, being in Rome in politics during that time, you know, you, you probably had to get your hands dirty or you're out, <laughs> you know, <laughs> like it's not the kind of place where you can, and well, he actually does talk about this a little bit because obviously Cato was one of his heroes, really. Seneca loved Cato, but Seneca believed that Cato, as far as I can tell from his letters, he believed that Cato was a little bit too quick to quick to take the moral high ground and make a scene, which inevitably led to his death, right? My sense of Seneca was that I think that he would have been the kind of person who, if he had to make really difficult decisions, like when he was working with Nero, and that wasn't a choice. He didn't choose to advise Nero. It was you get to come back from exile and advise my son to be emperor, otherwise see you later. And of course he could have done the Cato way and said, no, I'm sticking to my principles and, you know, you, no, I won't do what you say. But my sense of Seneca is that he probably would have been the kind of guy to say, well, maybe I can do some good here. Maybe it's best that I'm advising Nero. And even if he had to make some really tough decisions, it's like Seneca has a really, 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 really long-term vision of what wisdom is, right? Which is why he <laughs> says in his letters, I'm writing these letters for the future generations. That's what I'm doing it for. I want them to have something to hold on to. And he actually says, I know that these will find great favor in, in, in generations to come. So he, he had a sense that this, he, this was going to work. And I just think that there's a difference between that kind of, you know, you have to kind of break a few eggs to make an omelette sort of thing. You know, maybe he had that sort of view of things as, a, as opposed to Cato, who was, no, you know, I'll die for, for, for this. But I think you could make an argument that perhaps Seneca had a, a more long-term profound influence, you know, for the fact that he was able to live to the end of his life and write these letters and pass them on. So... I don't know. There's, I understand my thinking on this is a little bit unclear at the moment, but I guess what I'm trying to say is time will tell who has not been a hypocrite. I don't think <laughs> I don't think I know anyone who time will be favorable of, if that makes sense. Yeah, for for sure. I I definitely tend to agree there. And and even if not, you know, it's the question: Are we called to to judge? Are we called to label people this and that from the from the past who cares what you but think you, what have you done <laughs> you know what I mean? yeah like, hang on hang on have you read the letters like is is that the most important to you is that the most important thing to you the hypocrisy or are you trying to you know suck the marrow out of these letters because there's so much in there you know i, I think yeah. it's often a question of aims what's most important to you you know you said something that is is actually almost a direct quote from from this particular letter on the philosopher's seclusion, which I, I think he's written it a couple times. But he says, "I have withdrawn not only from men but from affairs. 
especially from my own affairs, I am working for later generations, writing down some ideas that may be of assistance to them. I, I just love that. But I want to, maybe if we can tie that into, and if you could share a bit about soul searching with Seneca and possibly connect the dots to a recent project, the sanctuary. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Seneca certainly has inspired me to think more long-term about the impact that I can have. And also just as, as a writer, as, as an artist, I feel like if you're not trying to write something that truly transcends the current moment, you know, transcends the current age, but, you know, aiming at wisdom that can be passed on to every generation. Obviously, there's different types of writers, there's different types of all this, but as a philosopher or as a person trying to be a philosopher, you know, in my own work, I'm always trying to, if I'm trying to do anything, capture some sort of wisdom that can be passed on you know, a, a kind of universal truth is what I'm trying to aim at always. And I think that Seneca was trying to aim at that as well. He wanted to pass something down to the, to the many generations, but I don't know, like Seneca to me is my, he's my philosophical inspiration more than anything. You know, when I think about who I want to be as a philosopher, I think Seneca is a pretty damn good marker, you know, to say this, he seemed like, he seemed like, especially towards the end, he was really putting things in order and, and, and really had a lot of, you know, wise things to say. But I guess when it comes to, you know, the walled garden and the sanctuary, yeah, I'll focus on the sanctuary at the moment, but for context for, for your listeners in the walled garden. So we're putting together the walled garden philosophical society what what I genuinely hope for the World Garden Philosophical Society is that it becomes its own culture, its own I hope that it outlives me, is what I is is what I would say. In the same way that Seneca hoped that his letters would outlive him and go on to future generations and, and, and aid them. And what the sanctuary is, is well, it's many things. It's going to be a podcast. It's going to be a grove in the world garden that features kind of an anthology of the best of my own poetic and, and musical creations. And it's also a, a school, you know, a school for the humanities, an academy for the humanities. Because to me, I don't know if there's a more important project in the world right now than showing people that there is profound meaning to be had in the vast array of the humanities. You know, I'm talking music, I'm talking poetry, philosophy, theology, you know, plays, musicals, you know, just that there's you know, photography, the visual arts, that there's so much to learn. There's so much, there's so much beauty out there, but you need to actually learn how to see it. You need to learn how to find it. One of the things that I noticed about Seneca is, as I said earlier, just just the beauty in his writings calls you to closer inspection. And so, you know, for me as a philosopher, as a teacher, as a mentor, you know, as the CEO of this, this organization, The World Garden, now I'm starting to think, well, I need to bring others into a relationship with these texts as well. And so how do I do that? Well, firstly, I need to pick the texts, you know, because I've, I've got my own creative pursuits. I've got my own poetry, my own, you know, which Seneca actually inspired because he said, well, you say Zeno said this and Cleanthes said this, but what do you say? And that was always in my mind as I was creating my own works. So my own works I consider as the proofs. I've done the work and this is a proof of the fact that I'm actually following this path as well. Now I want to bring other people in and say, well, let's explore Seneca's writings or let's explore Jung. Let's explore sacred texts. Let's look at the Bhagavad Gita. Let's, let's, let's look at the, the, the New Testament, the Old Testament. Yeah, let's, let's look at all of these profound texts that we've gathered over time 
and perhaps we can learn how to discern a sacred text, how to discern a text that's truly worth diving into, but also just pointing in all different directions to say, why don't you take that path? Or why don't you take this path? Why don't you, maybe you'll, you'd really like this teacher. Maybe you'd like that teacher. But I want people to go on their own adventures. I want people to go on the same adventure that I had with Seneca's writings, but to find a teacher that they really resonate with or a book or, you know, a sacred text. So I, I, I think I've jumped around a little bit there, but ultimately for me, what we're looking to do is to re-enchant people's minds, re-enchant the world so that people can see how much beauty there is out there in these great texts, in great art, in great music, you know, in the humanities. Hmm. Beautiful. Let me ask a final question, if I could, on, on this particular sure. letter. This idea of seclusion, stepping back from the crowd, maybe going within... Does that connect with you when you think about some of these ideas, whether it's creating the walled garden, the sanctuary? Is that needed for, for you? Yeah, it's... Well, just personally, I am actually, despite my public image, you might say, I'm an extremely introverted person. Like, for me, you know, just sitting there and doing some writing or creating some music, the, you know, the, the creative pursuits. These, these are really my form of prayer, and I do it a lot. Like, and, and I'm very, very happy that I get to, to do it a lot. But on the other, you know, in another sense, um, you know, I say I, I, I get to do it. I have chosen over the past couple of years to pull back from things that I do not deem to be as important as getting that solitude in order to receive something, you know. Now, I love working with people, whether it's one-on-one -on -one or in groups or having philosophical discussions, interviewing people. Th these are all things that I absolutely love. But at the end of the day, I always find great comfort in coming back to a certain seclusion and opening myself up to you know, to be able to receive what it is that I, I most need in order to move forward toward, you know, any objective that I'm doing or whether it's creative or business or relationship wise, whatever it is. And so, yeah, I mean, I personally, I really understand the kind of that, that need for, for seclusion, for, for quiet time. Yeah.